New Testament lesson is from Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 15 on page 177 in your pew Bible, inviting you to turn to that so that as I read it, you may follow along in it. Page 177, Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. This is a, a story about the work that was going on in the Galatian church trying to decide about how they were going to commit themselves to be Christians and what they were going to do with that. So listen now to what Paul has to say about this whole notion of what it means to be a Christian and how we're going to live out that Christian faith. We ourselves are Jews by birth, he says, and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we've come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things I once tore down, then I demonstrate I'm a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. As you know, today is Commitment Sunday at First Presbyterian Church here in Richmond, and later we'll make our commitments. And in the pews are commitment cards on one side for you to make your pledge. If you're not ready to do that or you're visiting with us today, on the other side is opportunity for you to check various things about your own personal commitment. And then we're going to ask everyone to come forward at the offering time to bring not only your commitment cards, but also your offering. And so it's a way in which we kind of demonstrate our dedication and our commitment in the life and work of this church. But first of all, what is commitment? What does it mean to commit to something and how does that affect and determine your life and my life? What difference does it make if we commit or if we don't? A Gallup poll so showed the commitment level of people in our workforce in this day and time. 13% of the workforce is ecstatic about going to work. They wake up in the morning with energy and with joy and can't wait to get there, and they just are full of, full of life and of energy for that work. 24% of the workforce do everything they can to work against the work they're doing. They complain, they, they grouse about stuff, they wish we weren't doing it this way, they just constantly are putting up roadblocks. Two-thirds of the workforce show up on time and leave on time and are kind of there going through the motions and get their paycheck. It's just kind of fascinating how our commitment in terms of our work has various levels to it as well. But then I saw something about the whole notion about people cohabitating before marriage, which always makes a lot of us nervous about that. And so why did that happen? And what is that about? And likely you will divorce if you do that before you marry. And part of the reason that people cohabitate is because it's easy. All my stuff is over at her house or all of my stuff is over at his house. We're there all the time with each other. One rent's better than two rent's. Let's just make it cheaper and easier. And then secondly, does this relationship have any legs to it? Is it going to make it? And what some people say is this is more about sliding instead of deciding. Sliding into a commitment instead of making a decision about a commitment but you get to a point in all of our life where you have to choice point, where you've got to make a decision whether you're gonna fish or cut bait, as they say in the South. For people who make a commitment, indicate that their commitment is gonna change their life and that they've got a plan. That to me is what we're about in terms of the life of the church. And that happens whether it's your commitment to the church, whether it's your commitment to your marriage, to the ball team that you're on, or the bridge club you're a part of, or your family, or whatever it might be. You have to decide. I have to decide. We have to decide. 
That's what they were struggling with in the church in Galatia back 2,000 years ago, trying to make a commitment of what does it mean to be a Christian and how do I know if I have made that or not? Some people want to live by the law and if they fulfilled the law, then they felt like they're okay. Others said, you've got to live by grace. You've got to live by the grace that comes to us in Jesus Christ. Some people wanted both and. Paul says you can't have that. You can't have both and as one or the other. And the example they had in that day was that a number of people were Jewish when they grew up, and so they were circumcised by the law. It was just a requirement. Their circumcision was part of what it meant to be Jewish. And so they figured if it was good enough for me, it's good enough for these new Christians too. So let's all get circumcised and then we can become Christian. The Gentiles were a little confused because circumcision wasn't an issue for them. They didn't know what they were talking about there. And so why do I have to jump through that hoop in order to become a Christian? Well, circumcision is really not part of the law today that I know of. It's more a medical issue, and most of us just have it done versus anything else, but we don't think it's part of our faith. But what about the Ten Commandments? What about you shall not steal, you shall not kill, shall not commit adultery, honor your father and mother, keep the Sabbath day holy, don't take the Lord's name in vain? We all know that. So what would happen if we tried to live our lives by the commandments? What happened if we try to live by making sure that those commandments were in good order and that we were following them? Paul says that just won't work. And I don't think it would work either because we'd spend all of our time trying to make sure that our keeping of the commandments was keeping the law. So if you kept the commandments, if you kept the law, you would live under the law. And your salvation would focus on your doing good. Your salvation would focus on whether you have kept the law. Your salvation would focus on all the good works you have done. It just is not going to happen. Paul says it's just not possible for us to keep up with all the laws and to follow those laws and to live a really good life. For salvation doesn't come by what you do. Salvation doesn't come by how good you are. Salvation is not something you inherit or something that you earn or something you can be good enough at so that you can be saved. Salvation comes because of what God has done, not what you have done, not what I have done. Our salvation is a gift from God. So we live by faith, we don't live by works. In other words, you can't do enough good things to be saved. It's just not in the cards. And God knew that. And the reason God sent his son was because we could not earn our salvation. So our life and our commitment is a response to what God has done, not what we do or what we try to do. Now for me, that's a freeing experience to know that it's not up to my good works It's not up to my good status. It's not up to my good position in life to earn my salvation. We need not fret about keeping the Ten Commandments perfectly. We need not burden ourselves of trying to keep up with all of that. But be clear, the Ten Commandments are crucial. They're an important part of who we are. They give us a good sense of what life is about and how to live with people and how to have meaningful life but they are not our avenue to salvation. Jesus Christ is our avenue to salvation. And somehow we just don't get it. We keep saying we need to do more if God's going to show us his favor. While in seminary, Bomber Kelly was teaching New Testament. And every time he talked about a particular passage of scripture in the class, he would go up to someone on the front row and give them a $10 bill and said, this is a gift. It's yours, you didn't earn it, you didn't know it was coming, it was yours. And he'd go on and talk about salvation and and being accepted and all those kind of things. And every time, at the end of class, the student would try to give the $10 back. It was mind-boggling, but revelatory, that we don't think we earn it, we don't think we deserve it, we don't think we're good enough for it. And guess what? You're not. God does it because God loves us and gives us life 
life eternal. But then Paul moves on in verse 20 to another phrase. He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I have died if I accept this gift of salvation. My old self is gone. My new self is here. And now Christ lives in me so that I can live fully. In 1888, a Norwegian businessman reached for the morning paper and thumbed through it and had the shock of his life. He read his obituary. It was a mistake, of course, because he was still breathing, he was still above ground, but it was a mistake. And he had quite a revelation about that. The blunder was because his brother had died and the news reporter had put the wrong information, the wrong name in there. But he got a rare glimpse of how the world saw him and he was most shocked about that. What was written was pretty accurate. It described all of his achievements. It, it described all his business wealth. It described all his accomplishments. It described everything he had done. But it didn't say anything in there about what he valued and what was important to him and what was really significant in his life. And on that day, Alfred Nobel started a new life. As a result of that, he gave away all his money. He made provisions in his will for the Nobel Peace Prize to reward people for doing good work for humanity as well as peace. In effect, he rewrote his obituary that day. What would happen if you tomorrow morning read your obituary in the Richmond Times Dispatch? What kind of image and picture would that give to people? Would it be accurate? And if you could rewrite your obituary, what would you do? How would you see yourself dying in Christ in order to live a new life? What would you do differently that you haven't done before? This new life in Christ is a gift, a gift freely given to us so that we can find out what real life is all about. But a gift is also a demand. If the gift is worth anything, if the gift changes your life, then it seems that it makes a difference in how you live, how you think, what you do. The gift, if it's worth anything, is a desire to change our way of doing things, to reflect that that gift is a way in which our lives are now different, that you will have a different perspective, you'll have a different approach to life, you'll begin a new life that makes a difference a significant difference with other people and other people's lives. It's an opportunity for us to say that the gift really did make a difference. We often think that salvation, justification by faith, is an individual kind of thing, that I get saved and you get saved and we all get saved individually. And that's true. But there's also a corporate expression of that justification by faith that Jesus Christ, by giving us this gift, also gave the gift to create what we call the church, the community of believers, the faithful disciples of Christ. And we're here today because of this gift called the church and was called into being. And like individuals, this gift also has a demand on us as a congregation, a demand that we are responsible to respond to the good news of Christ, that this group called First Presbyterian Church re responds and is a reflection of what this new life in Christ is all about. So my question to you, what is the church worth for you? What does the church do that causes you to get up on a cold morning, get dressed and look decent and come to worship? Why would we commit ourselves to the life of a congregation? What difference is it making in this community? For over 200 years, this congregation has made a difference in this community. Over 200 years ago, a group of folks said, this is important. They sacrificed and they worked and they gave to the life of this congregation and thought that people gathered as First Presbyterian Church were a significant 
opportunity to share the good news of Christ. We stand on those shoulders today. We're part of that great cloud of witnesses that people thought important enough that we're able to realize it this day. We're called to keep the church going, to help build up the kingdom of God here at First Church. And those efforts continue in the 207th year in 2019, assisting the seminary to build a facility that will help educate pastors and educators after they finish their seminary degree, to finish the classroom technology project at George Mason Elementary School that you've been so involved with, to contribute to the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Fund so that when there's another hurricane or natural disaster that people know that God's people are there with them and for them, plus the whole mission and ministry of this congregation, nurturing children and nurturing youth, the grieving group that begins this afternoon, the local mission programs that we do, the regular worship and inspiring music in this place, all of which are a way to say thanks to God for what God is doing for us in Jesus Christ. But this year, I would add another focus to our commitments for 2019. Without a pastor, head of staff, it's a pretty significant time for all of us to step up. For it will be a significant message to this congregation, as well as to the new future pastor when he or she arrives, that this church is about this church. With all due respect to pastors, church ain't about the preacher. They're important, don't get me wrong, but they ain't the whole show. The church are the people in these pews, in this congregation, that make quite a difference. Now, I realize that some of you are anxious about when a pastor is going to arrive, that wondering if he or she's going to ever show up. Well, let me guarantee you they are because I ain't going to stay here forever. (laughs) It's pretty normal for congregations to be anxious. It's pretty normal for congregations to be worried because who's in charge? But to hesitate our support for the life of this congregation at this time sends the wrong message. Because this church is not about the preacher. This church is about the 1,200 members here that are making a difference right now in this community and around this world. You are the church. And so your commitment today is really about your relationship with Christ. It's not about how big your pledge is or how small your pledge is. It's about your commitment to Jesus Christ and how you want to demonstrate that as you step up and make your commitment on his behalf. So what is your commitment? What is your commitment of yourself to Christ? How are you going to show and demonstrate that commitment as you make your commitment for 2019? I can't think of a better way of saying thank you to God for the gift that we have in Jesus Christ and for the fact that our salvation is our gift and it gives us life now and life eternal. May it be so. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this opportunity for us to demonstrate who Jesus Christ is for us, for us to make this spiritual decision about how we're going to respond to your good news of how you've made a difference in our lives and hopefully we can make some difference in other people's lives. Help us to do that, O oh God, and to live out our faith in a very significant way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.